One of the big questions that comes up in this work is when we say no thoughts, what does no thoughts mean? Does it mean never having anything in consciousness? Or are there certain kinds of thoughts that are okay and some kinds of thoughts that aren't okay? So I'd like to talk today about thoughts that we really are focused on in this work. And I would say guidance would be problematic thoughts are the kind we're trying to get rid of. Um, this came to me when I was going to graduate school, walking down the hill and towards campus. And I had one of those epiphanous moments where I dropped back and looked at my, my consciousness and saw that, in fact, I had endless streaming thoughts of no particular consequence. So the question was, well, could I get rid of these? I was trying to find some way to rid myself of all the anxiety that was coming out of these thoughts, desires, whatever. So I thought, well, can I go out and just look at getting rid of problematic thoughts? Is there a way to deal with this? So what we're trying to look at now are things that are, if you look at your consciousness, we did the three boxes before, and look, I, me, my, and no, I, me, my, in the one experiment we did. <clears throat> And found out that, in fact, virtually everybody has most of their thoughts as I, me, my. Something like 90x percent of most people's thoughts are all about them. Problematic ones are all of those uh, problems. They're self-referential. Because they have this I, me, my in them. And they are emotional. And the characteristic they have is that they're sticky, Velcro-like. I mean, their nature is to pull other thoughts, other memories might be associated with this particular item that you're running through consciousness. <clears throat> it tends to pull other thoughts in with it, and we get these spirals that begin working up from a small problem into a giant problem. A small little bit of anger that might be triggered by someone cutting you off in traffic. Uh, could result in <clears throat> you <clears throat> chasing this person down I-5 with your car and running them off the road. Uh, that's what starts. Or you see some you know, person of the opposite sex or whatever sex you your desire, and it turns in from something that's interesting to be something that's an enormous craving in all the way up into what we call lust. So the idea is to uh, limit this self-referential thinking. We don't get these big spirals, and we don't get these we call a flywheel you know, flywheel, once it gets started, it spins faster and faster and faster and faster and keeps that motion going. So we try to cut down this phenomena and this phenomena by not having these self-referential, emotional, sticky thoughts. There are, however, thoughts that are not problematic that we really <clears throat> need to retain. These are planning, problem-solving, Thoughts. This was a big concern for me because I was a knowledge worker, working on my PhD, and my whole professional career was spent in these kinds of planning, problem-solving areas. <clears throat> so if I lost this, and at the same time lost this, that was not a good trade. <clears throat> Fortunately, it turned out not to be that way. I could lose this and keep this, in fact, even enhance the functionality of this type of thought. Uh, fortunately, in the meantime, we have found a lot of cognitive neuroscience to support the differentiation between these two. One of the classical papers is one that's called FARB, and you've got this, you can have access to this course, this is an R. <clears throat> and what they found out was they took people, this is you looking forward, eyes, nose. What Farb did was look at um, 45 minutes of mindfulness meditation for two months and said, okay, we first started this, we found that two centers very deep in the brain, very deep down here in the core, limbically, this posterior cingulate cortex and this medial prefrontal cortex uh, were the key centers in what we now know as something called the default mode network, the DMN. 
this was functioning, you had blah, blah, blah. You had this problematic thoughts, endless this, which goes on for most people most of the time that they're awake. They also found that after <clears throat> some of this two months of meditation, that in fact, during meditation, this network could be shut down. These were not functional. And in our place, you had a, another network, <clears throat> which had several components. Um, you had an insula out here. And a posterior parietal here. And a prefrontal cortex up here. This network, when it was functioning, no blah, blah, blah. This shutting down of blah, 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 as we brought this network online, this, be this became called the task positive network. If you were doing tasks, solving math problems, meditating, uh, being mindful, consciously. Uh, this task positive network operates and this default mode network does not operate. It says T P N. There is this battle going on between the default mode network and the task positive network to see who's going to be dominant. If you're doing a task, you're, what, you're mountain climbing, solving a complicated physics problem, um, even if you're meditating, uh, concentrating, uh, this network will be operative and you'll shut this network down. If, on the other hand, this network keeps operating, the default mode network keeps operating, and will not be quiet when this is trying to do tasking, in fact, you'll find this network overrides this one, and you confuse your tasking network. So, in fact, what happens is you get things like uh, ADHD. And this is some good papers out recently on this very phenomenon, that if this is dominant over that, you get ADHD. So it's really useful if we can shut down this network through meditation or whatever, to make this thing happen. This differentiation is what we found between, uh, with meditation for two months, that in fact you could shut this down, stop this operating, and have this one be the dominant one. Bad news is, once you stop meditating, then this goes, and you're back into this one, operating continuously. question about problem solving is we're over here and we have a complicated problem to solve. Something that requires a lot of nonlinear thinking. This will be a problem that isn't just 1, 2, 3, but maybe it's 1, 2, J, L, 14, 6. To solve this problem requires some kind of discontinuous creativity, some kind of aha moment, some kind of understanding that takes place that um, you didn't have before. A new way of seeing something or understanding something. A lot of research done on this as well <clears throat> by some papers on the Journal of Neuroscience in 2009-2010 looked at this problem solving. They gave people these complicated problems and watched what happened in an EEG. And they found that, in fact, as they were solving a problem, this part of the brain, back in here, uh, actually saw a tremendous change in beta frequencies, which are like uh, less than 30 cycles per second. And as the problem got solved, after this gathering information, accumulating it, working on information, when the problem was getting solved, lo and behold, what happened is they saw the big EEG shift up to here. Higher frequencies, these are gammas, and also localization up in this area. Once the problem was solved and was recognized. So we have this movement along this right hand side from back here to up there as the problem is solved, resolved, answer comes up. This is all done offline. <clears throat> After this has been solved, they, they actually can watch this 100% of the time. Six to eight seconds before you become aware of it, they can watch it happen right here on EEG, also fMRI. So we have these, these three different kinds of situations. We have this task-positive network, which can be used to suppress a default mode network, and many of our, like most of our pleasures have to do with doing a lot of tasks in here to make this thing busy enough so you don't fall back into your blah-blah network. 
And you can also solve problems offline without your being consciously aware of it until when you frame the problem up here, send it down, and then it's worked on subconsciously and up comes at the end an answer. We had this one metaphor that we've used before of this elephant and a rider. This will be a schematic elephant. I'm not a good elephant in far. This will be a schematic elephant. Um, this is the elephant, and the elephant is this uh, offline high-speed processor with massive data retrieval and massive data storage capability that is our brain, our 100 billion neurons and 50 trillion synaptic interconnections. <clears throat> On top of that sits a rider, and this is our working mind, workspace. It's basically the press secretary for the brain that frames the problem, sends it down here to be worked on, it's worked on, the answer comes back up again. This is the part that works, this is the elephant, and up here on top is the writer that gets the information and then talks about it. It says, I solve this problem. So we have this three different kinds of networks here that we can be uh, acquainted with now through cognitive neuroscience. The fault mode network, which is blah blah when you're not doing anything. Task positive network, when you are doing something, concentrating, focusing. And then problem solving, which takes place, the complicated stuff takes place offline, which you aren't even conscious of. So all the big breakthroughs, discoveries, and that, the aha moments come about from working back in here, of which you're, which you're not conscious, and then solving the problem up here, and then announcing it up here. So that's three different kinds of thoughts. Thank you. Thank you.